we will be going live in a few minutes, uh, live on Facebook with this. I hope the DSG can join us um, soon. Uh, greetings, everyone, and uh, my name is uh, Ruhimat Surakusuma, the head of the uh, sub-regional office for Southeast Asia at SCAP here in Bangkok. Uh, welcome to the roundtable discussion on empowering ASEAN women in agriculture. Uh, this event is co-organized by the ASEAN Secretariat, UN SCAP, Grow Asia Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, and Oxfam. So as we all know, Agriculture is a key sector in ASEAN, accounting for a substantial share in the region's G GDP and employing an important segment of the workforce. Uh, statistics show that as many as 64% of employed women in Lao PDR are engaged in agriculture, 39% in Vietnam, and 34% in Cambodia. In the other member states, Thailand's one third of GDP is attributed to agriculture more than 30% in Indonesia and 8% in the Philippines. Of course, throughout the decades, there has been a shift to manufacturing and other off-farm services sectors in several of these ASEAN countries. But a significant part of the population remains dependent uh, on agriculture. While agriculture is at varying stages of the development, there are remarkable similarities in the constraints faced by women in the agricultural sector. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges for the agriculture sector, and even more so, it has affected achieving the progress in the Sustainable Development Goals 
including goal one on no poverty, goal two on zero hunger, but also has the potential to reverse or at least regress uh, the progress made in recent years. These, those highly impact, impacted uh, by the pandemic include women in the agricultural sector. It is in this regard, the impact of the pandemic has signaled a call for action that addresses across cutting issues. Therefore, it is timely that this roundtable discussion is organized with the objectives of one, dialogue and learn on the ASEAN policies on women's economic empowerment, especially as they relate to women in agriculture and the agricultural value chains. Two, advance inclusive recovery and building back better, the fairer, given the impact of COVID-19 in the agriculture sector. And thirdly, explore ASEAN policies on food security, resilience, and women's economic empowerment. Allow me to begin the program uh, with a opening remarks from His Excellency Kung Fok, who is the Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN Social Cultural Community to deliver his remarks. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ruhi. Uh, senior officials and representative from the ASEAN uh, sector bodies and ASEAN entities, representative from civil society organization, international organizations, the academic, the private sector and partner organizations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to attend the event this afternoon. Uh, this roundtable discussion uh, is indeed timely and relevant since it provides a platform to investigate and also articulate the links and nuances of strengthening the agencies of women in agriculture in the ASEAN region. Uh, and in particular, we have an opportunity to share and unpack good practices at the national level and also regional level that can inform and shape future policies and programs. I would like to emphasize that today's discussion could not have come at a more opportune time, considering the continuing saga of the COVID-19 pandemic that has gripped the whole world. More than a year after the outbreak, we have become more acutely aware of the uh, pandemic uh, gender impact across different groups of people living in different uh, settings and localities. With this in mind, I would like to share three points as we move forward to the discussion this afternoon. First, the importance of locating women in the agricultural sector, the multiple roles that they fulfill and barriers and challenges that they face cannot be overemphasized. According to the ASEAN uh, Gender Outlook, which was launched in March uh, 2021, women who are most left behind are those living in rural areas and poor household and who are members of ethnic minority groups. This is reinforced by the finding of the ASEAN SDG indicator baseline report uh, 2020, which states that incidence of poverty is more felt in rural areas. Uh, admittedly, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been primarily urban, considering higher population densities and the difficulties of physical distancing the pandemic, economic, and social impact is rapidly uh, crippling to both yeah. yeah. Moreover, oh. the uh, pandemic has deeply affected the income stream and overall viability of micro, small, and medium enterprises uh, in the ASEAN region, which is a sector where there's an over-representation of women. This finding points toward a more new and understanding of the roles of uh, women in fulfilling within the agricultural sectors and the dynamic in the play between rural and urban areas. Such findings also invite us to uh, interrogate um, the incidence and impact of women migrant work vis-a-vis -vis building and sustaining local rural economies. Uh, second, it is imperative to unearth and unpack the dynamic in the linkages uh, between cross-cutting sectoral issues to empower women in agriculture. We are very fortunate to have representatives from uh, ASEAN body working on various sectors such as on food, agriculture and forestry, rural development and poverty eradication, gender equality and women empowerment, and the promotion of the micro, small, medium enterprises in the ASEAN region. The conversation this afternoon, hopefully, uh, will add value to the respective core work of this ASEAN body. And beyond that, there's an opportunity to identify pathway and entry point that link this uh, work stream. Undertaking such an analysis uh, requires uh, inter interrogating the productive and reproductive role of uh, women and men in various 
and oftentimes overlapping contexts unique to the ASEAN region. This refers to, for example, rapid uh, urbanizations, aging society, the frequencies and increasing intensity of disaster and the digital revolution. In analyzing the link between this uh, cross-cutting uh, areas of work, uh, we are fortunate to benefit from the perspective of stakeholders in the region. Uh, truly, a partnership is key in ensuring a robust understanding of this issue and ultimately the translation of such understanding into concrete action. Uh, finally, uh, empowering women in agriculture relies on women's own agencies, uh, powers and voice, and that is our collective responsibility to seize opportunity to work together toward this end. From the uh, same perspective, uh, let me share some concrete entry points uh, at the regional level. ASEAN has been engaged in mainstreaming gender in all aspects of its work. The ASEAN Gender Mainstreaming Strategy Framework is currently being finalized and intends to guide all ASEAN sector bodies and the ASEAN member state in introducing gender perspective in their areas of work. Uh, as ASEAN moves toward recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, ASEAN has adopted the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and the framework articulated that women has been uh, impacted disproportionately by the pandemic it also recognizes that women comprises 70% uh, of frontline responders, social worker, health professional, community volunteers, and majority of caregivers at home and in communities. Uh, under the broad strategy on strengthening human security, the recovery framework mainstream uh, gender equality uh, throughout the recovery scheme and action of ASEAN. It intends to build resilience, particularly through women's economic empowerment and tape the agencies of women as driver of the recovery process. Uh, I, I also would like to underscore that during the ASEAN uh, Women uh, Leader Summit held in November uh, 2020, uh, the ASEAN leader committed to place women leadership and contribution at the heart of the recovery uh, efforts, particularly in the implementation of the uh, ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan. So to conclude, it is my hope that we all learn from the exchange of knowledge and information this afternoon and I wish uh, everyone a productive and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rui. Ronik, you may now go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, DSG Excellency, for uh, uh, for your remarks. Uh, may may I also take this opportunity to welcome all participants joining this event. From the registration, we have uh, representatives uh, from governments, uh, cooperatives, SME, as well as NGOs, and these are not only from uh, the ASEAN region but also from outside the region. Uh, representing from countries such as Australia, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, US, Hungary, Pakistan, Nepal, Taiwan, the Bahamas, and also uh, the Netherlands. So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, seminar. So to proceed uh, with our uh, program, we are very uh, pleased and fortunate to have a distinguished panel uh, who will be presenting uh, on a lot of the issues that are uh, of topical uh, today. Uh, maybe remind the panelists that you have been allotted 15 minutes for your engagements uh, with the participants. And we also encourage all participants uh, to write their questions in the Q&A uh, chat box. So leading the distinguished panel is uh, Dr. Sita Sumrit, who is head of the Poverty Eradication and Gender Division uh, at the ASEAN Secretariat. Be addressing the status of policies and programs uh, in ASEAN, as well as how these policies address women empowerment in the region, especially in agriculture. Uh, Dr. Sita, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Pat Rani, uh, for the floor. Uh, for this um, presentation by the ASEAN Secretariat, we will be focusing on the uh, ASEAN's progress in um, 
promoting women's economic empowerment as well as gender mainstreaming. So I would like to uh, ask the organizer to uh, share the screen on the presentation from the Asian Secretariat. And please allow me to turn off the camera so we can focus uh, on the presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, for um, this presentation, Advancing Women's Economic Empowerment and Gender Mainstreaming in ASEAN, uh, we would like to highlight uh, two interconnected efforts uh, by ASEAN in, of course, uh, addressing um, the importance of women's economic empowerment. So here is just a very quick uh, snapshot on the statistics uh, on gender in the economy, uh, especially on women making up around half of the graduates in most ASEAN countries, but only 30% um, make it into the leadership uh, positions at work. Uh, however, um, a number of uh, evidence and data from different sources um, demonstrate that uh, women's economic empowerment is actually a good economics, um, adding the values into uh, GDP as well as uh, overall economic contribution if uh, women are ec economically uh, empowered. Also, uh, we would like to bring your attention, uh, of course, uh, to the smart economics, including um, mainstreaming gender and empowerment of women and girls uh, into the education, uh, level as well as financial and digital inclusion, legal protection, as well as unpaid care work. So we highlight unpaid care work and then we come back uh, to this uh, later. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, here uh, as well, um, this is to uh, give you a bit of the context uh, on uh, later, um, we will be presenting on the regional uh, mandates and frameworks on women's economic empowerment. So uh, of course, um, this is a very promising uh, picture given that there is a remarkable increase of women owned of SMEs among all ASEAN countries. So you can see here 60 point million women entrepreneurs uh, are already in existence uh, and thriving in the 10 ASEAN countries. And of course, uh, we pay um, special attention to uh, promoting women's participation and skills in the uh, STEAM area, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, uh, among others. And uh, again, uh, we use the statistics from uh, UNSCAP on increasing women's participation in the economy could add uh, an additional 12 uh, US trillion to annual global input by 2025. There's also other sources like McKinsey um, and um, the World Bank. Uh, so you, you may want to look at it on the, um, the uh, cal calculation on economic empowerment, um, economic contribution of uh, women for the regional economy. Next slide, please. So I try to go uh, really fast, but uh, again, we would like to um, underscore that uh, there are a number of ASEAN instruments uh, to advance the empowerment of women and girls. And this, we only listed um, the recent ones. And it's important that we listed uh, them even if the name may not say women's economic empowerment or may not say agriculture, but uh, given its um, interlinked uh, nature, uh, we uh, present here, of course, the Declaration on the Gender Responsive Implementation of ASEAN Community Vision 2025 and the SDGs. So this was the first explicit attempt, not only to bridge uh, ASEAN vision and the SDGs, um, but also to uh, ensure that gender uh, is taken into account as cross-cutting um, issue and lens um, for these uh, two very important uh, vision and goals. And uh, highly relevant what we are discussing now um, at this round table um, is the action agenda on mainstream women's, women's economic empowerment. This was also um, adopted in 2017, along with the Declaration on Gender Responsive Implementation of the uh, community, ASEAN Community Vision and the SDGs. I'm trying to go really fast, so I hope uh, I still make sense. And the last one, of course, um, the joint statement on women, peace and security. So the women, peace and security agenda is uh, gaining um, heightened momentum um, at the ASEAN level last year and this year as well. And one of the key 
um, elements moving forward is to promote women's economic empowerment in all sectors and areas uh, in the context of um, post-conflict rehabilitation and recovery. Next slide, please. So um, for this slide, uh, we just want to show you very briefly the action agenda on mainstreaming WEE in ASEAN. So if you look at one, uh, two, six, uh, these are uh, the key action points that we hope uh, to accelerate and implement um, to promote uh, WE in ASEAN, including, of course, addressing all the barriers, uh, promoting women's participation and skills development in ICT and in the STEAM areas, as well as increased uh, investment, um, especially in the area of MSMEs and increased um, women's representation and leadership in the workforce. So this uh, came across uh, very strongly in the messages of the ASEAN leaders uh, during the first um, ASEAN Women Leaders uh, Summit held uh, last year. Uh, of course, we need uh, public and private sector collaboration. I think this is, again, very pertinent to what we are discussing here today and consider organizing an annual ad ASEAN Women's Business Conference. So this is already ongoing in the pipeline of the as uh, relevant ASEAN sectoral bodies. Next slide, please. So uh, of course, uh, we talked about women's empowerment, uh, but we cannot talk about it without also understanding that this is, uh, of course, it has its own rights as a standalone uh, issue, but it's also within uh, the broader framework of the ASEAN gender mainstreaming efforts so that um, it's tackled as um, um, the synergize um, issues. So um, on the key developments and milestones on the uh, gender mainstreaming strategic framework for ASEAN, it started again uh, since 2017 with the adoption of the declaration that I've already touched upon. Um, so with such mandate, we need a clear framework at the regional level for all the sector bodies and all the ASEAN sectors to understand what is gender mainstreaming and how to do it. So these are just the steps uh, that have been taken. And the most important one perhaps is the development of the ASEAN gender mainstreaming strategic framework. We receive support from USAID and US ASEAN prospect uh, to do this and it's already being finalized. And this year uh, we are excited uh, to roll out uh, such framework um, and to get the buy-in from the ASEAN sector bodies beyond uh, just the sociocultural uh, community. Next slide, please. So relevant to um, our discussion today, of course, uh, what we mean by the ASEAN gender mainstreaming strategic framework uh, is uh, not only strategic nature, but it has to address uh, the practical needs of ASEAN sector bodies, including um, the ASEAN sector bodies uh, dealing with rural development, agriculture, uh, economic integration, as this is, um, this is broad, but uh, we hope for it to also be uh, relevant to all sectors. Um, it also uh, serves as a tool for the ASEAN member states and ASEAN to achieve gender equality goals. So mainstreaming uh, gender and promoting women's economic empowerment at the end of the day uh, will fit into the overall goal of uh, achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls uh, in ASEAN. Uh, we also attempt to enumerate key milestones until 2024. 2025, so it's in line with the, um, the current ASEAN community vision. And uh, we also add in the forecast for the vision post-2025. So um, we really hope that this will be an impactful and long-lasting framework that ASEAN and the ASEAN uh, sectors uh, can use in the long run. Next slide, please. Okay, so this I, I've already explained that it's uh, an overarching framework, but we also want it to be practical and at the same time there will be uh, capacity buildings, dialogues um, and other endeavors uh, to ensure that people 
uh, are aware and understand and can really use this uh, framework. We don't expect this to be uh, adopted and um, applied by all ASEAN sectors without um, capacity building and the ongoing dialogue. And that's why this round table is also very important for the agriculture sector as well as MSMEs uh, sector and women's sector to come together uh, to um, learn. Um, and we hope that this is also part of the dialogue and capacity building efforts uh, to mainstream gender into uh, all sectors of ASEAN. Next slide, please. So um, these are the practical uh, milestones that we would like to highlight, uh, including um, a very uh, laudable um, efforts of the AMAF or the ASEAN um, sector working on agriculture um, and uh, forestry uh, as they are one of the first movers uh, in uh, mainstreaming gender in the food, agriculture and forestry uh, sectors. Um, you can, of course, uh, consult um, their guidelines on gender mainstreaming also available online. Um, so these are uh, the attempt to apply a gender perspective um, in um, the agriculture uh, sector, including uh, relevant uh, programs to ensure that women working in food, agriculture and forestry uh, sectors in ASEAN are empowered. So um, this, uh, they use the empowering approach uh, to um, gender mainstreaming. And of course, it's also concerns uh, when we talk about women in agriculture, it's also concerns the label, uh, the labor and empl em employment policies to promote decent work uh, for all. So there's already the task force working on gender mainstreaming in the labor and employment policies to promote decent work uh, for all. And this is led by uh, the labor sector of uh, ASEAN. Um, and interestingly, uh, when we talk about women in agriculture and women in rural development, um, it will not make sense if we also, uh, if we skip um, the issues of um, disaster management, uh, prevention and mitigation. So the ASEAN sector working on um, disaster um, management and response uh, has already embraced uh, gender mainstreaming and established a technical working group uh, to um, sharpen the policies and programs on protection, gender, and inclusivity under the, um, the work on disaster management, both in the urban and rural areas. Next slide, please. And here, um, of course, uh, the, we have organized the Gender Mainstream Workshop in Rural Development and Poverty Eradication. And this is for the ASEAN sector working on rural development and poverty eradication. Um, and as a result of the commitment and uh, the workshop as part of the capacity buildings, their current work plan, um, which will be um, approved uh, very soon in from 2020, uh, 2021 to 2025 under the strategic areas of human as in uh, human capital and human development, uh, improved access and use by women uh, of ICTs, financing and new technologies to develop production and livelihoods uh, is one of the key uh, priority areas uh, with um, the objective of increase in number of women-led enterprises and increase in incomes and quality of employment for rural women and youth. So uh, we can proudly say that the new work plan of the rural development and poverty eradication um, uh, sector of ASEAN is, uh, I think, very gender responsive uh, and explicit um, in uh, their commitment uh, to uh, promote uh, gender equality and empowerment and girls in the context of rural development and poverty eradication. Here also with the environment sector, again, uh, very relevant to rural women and women in agriculture. Um, we worked uh, closely with UN Women on the Empower Project to address gender-based vulnerability um, through mainstreaming gender and human rights concerns in climate change and disaster risk reduction uh, in ASEAN. So these are just the recent and practical key developments and milestones um, 
for ASEAN to promote um, women's career empowerment and gender mainstreaming for all women, including uh, rural women and women in agriculture and uh, enterprise, uh, rural enterprise uh, sector. Next slide, please. I think this will be um, the uh, the last slide uh, from our end. So of course we have already presented on uh, regional mandates uh, on the key messages on the gender mainstreaming uh, framework as well as on some of the practical progresses um, of the ASEAN bodies um, working on agriculture, poverty, eradication, rural development, um, environment, as well as uh, labor and disaster management. So uh, this last slide, uh, we would like to um, present here, uh, what can we do moving forward? Um, and we hope that this will be uh, helpful for further discussion at, uh, for this round table. So the first one, of course, we need to map and identify priority areas to implement women's economic empowerment agenda across sectors and pillars. Uh, it's so broad, it's so important that we need to map and identify what can be done first and how, uh, as of course for the converted like ourselves, we uh, at least understand the importance and at least understand the basic of how we can do this. However, we need to map and identify priority areas for other sectors that uh, perhaps gender and women's economic empowerment or the, the discussion on rural women in agriculture uh, may be relatively new for them. Uh, second, uh, promoting cross-sectoral and cross-pillar dialogue and collaboration. So before we go into collaboration, it's important for us to create the dialogue uh, for mutual understandings or misunderstanding that's also fine so that we can find the solutions in working together. Um, Number three, of course, identify entry points um, and mainstreaming women's economic empowerment in the work of ASEAN sector. And uh, we highlight here the work plan 2021 to 2025 because this is the new entry point as most of the ASEAN sectors are starting their new work plan uh, this year. Uh, number four, again, highlight the issue of intersectionality, uh, multiple vulnerabilities and special inequality um, in moving forward with women's economic empowerment um, to uh, enrich our narratives uh, on um, women's leadership uh, in the area of um, economic empowerment that goes beyond the urban uh, narratives uh, of uh, WEE. Number five, of course, conduct more research and evidence-based uh, analysis to inform policy and practices, especially on WE and unpaid care work. Um, and the issue of unpaid care work is uh, high on the agenda of the ASEAN Committee uh, on um, Women, um, especially in um, the context of their uh, current work plan, 2021 to 2025, as unpaid care work uh, is um, ident often identified as one of the key barriers uh, for women's economic empowerment uh, for uh, women, whether they are in the urban or rural sector. Uh, number six, of course, we will continue with campaign and advocacy on women's economic leadership and entrepreneurship at all levels in both urban and rural sectors. So we hope that uh, this uh, six uh, indicative um, points uh, for us to move forward to Together will be of some use uh, for this roundtable and the discussion that will uh, ensue. So we um, we would like to end the presentation from the ASEAN Secretariat here. Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to hand over the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sita. Uh, a very well uh, presentation. Um, uh, I would like to apologize. I'm having some technical diff difficulties uh, on, on the video, but I hope you can hear me well. So uh, again, Dr. Sita has uh, updated on what ASEAN is doing with respect to the uh, WEE. And I think I think we lost Ronnie. Uh, so um, this is Gomer. Um, may we now proceed to the um, second speaker? We have with us Dr. Um, uh, we have with us Mr. Chai Chai Seng Yin um, from Thailand to share on us um, 
their their um, mainstreaming efforts in doing uh, women's economic empowerment in the RDPE sector, as well as their um, framework in um, doing um, SDG work in Thailand. Mr. Sengin, go ahead, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished delegate, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to be the panelist of Lao Table on empowering ASEAN women in agriculture to share the progress made by the Thai government on this issue. Thailand is one of the ASEAN as the land of agricultural and fisheries country because of the geography of the country. The 70% of our population is the farmer. Each year, we have export the agro product to allow the world. The Royal Thai government have realized to policy tracking to export. to extremely quality farms and our products because this important to health and nutrition of human beings to their livelihood underlie the important load in the issue today of implementing to a sustainable development goals. Goal one, no poverty. That the Ministry of Interior as national focal point that have mentioned the function is immunization provide a platform for delivering nutrition interventions and work hard in hand with good nutrition. According to goal two, zero hunger, immunization and good nutrition go hand in hand. Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperative as national focal point to enhance this issue. They also have cooperate with FAO, WFP and other agricultural organization to research and development for the technical farmland, not only on quality of product, but also concerned to the quality products, as well as being to maintenance of environment. Another issue under SDGs that we have never forget to concern is goal number five, gender equality, immunization, empower women and girls. These days, the law of women is extremely important to the world. ASEAN share promise to leave no one behind. Women is one part of the vulnerable group that all the agendas have to put on their place. Ministry of Social Development and Human Security as national for point, thus advancing sustainable development, especially includes the empowerment of women. Thailand has legally advanced women's rights and gender equality through its ratification of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, in 1985, and its optional protocol in 2000, endorsed the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995 and commit to the SDG in 2015. Thailand has made significant effort to integrate the international principles and instruments into registration and policy. Evident in the constitution of the Kingdom of Thailand 2017, which clearly specifies that men and women shall enjoy equal rights. The Gender Equality Act 2015, which was enacted in 2015, established a committee to promote gender equality to enact the Act's legal policies and mechanism to advance gender equality. In addition, the Women Development Strategy, developed by the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security, set out goals, objectives, and targets in the area of gender equality, which will be steering tools for effective budget allocations. Thailand has a greater percentage of women in senior leadership positions than both 
the Asia Pacific region, and global average. In Thailand, mid market companies, women hold 32% of senior leadership positions. It's higher than the global average of 27%, as well as the Asia Pacific average of 26%. There have also been recent improvements among mid-market companies. The number of business with no women in senior management has decreased by 5 percentage points from 19% in 2019 to 14% in 2020. As with several other related indicators, Thailand's numbers on this metric show more diversity than the overall average for both the region and the world. Thailand is also performing comparatively well when it comes to having women in the highest position of power. 24% of CEOs, managing directors in Thailand are women, compared to 20% worldwide and only 13% in Asia Pacific. The senior leadership position held by women in Thailand, the most is chief financial officer, which contributes to fully 43%, making Thailand the world's third highest percentage of female CEOs. Many mid-market business in Thailand are looking to build on this trend towards equality. Furthermore, those policies have been attempted to put the players will enhance the social protection on women in agriculture to protect women from poverty, discrimination, and exploitation. On the other hand, the initiative policy to avoid the insecure and vulnerable job in the informal sector, including in agriculture and as own account and contributing family workers with all lead a small minority in senior positions. As the ambition 2025 and the lying of the sectoral bodies as well as across pillars. Ministry of Interior as some RDPE Thailand. Some RDPE initiate the framework action plan on rural development and poverty eradication 2021 to 2025. The work plan has just endorsed by the 17 SOM RDPE on 26 March 2021. The five strategic objectives exactly have to work together with several sectoral bodies. The main priority that we mentioned is agriculture sector because the resilient rural development and sustainable property eradication is depend on the economic based on agriculture. Thailand, underlie the agriculture policies, we have probably to mention the Royal Initiative Projects. It's a key mechanism that will lead Thailand towards sustainable, that emerging challenge regarding poverty, irritating and human development issues. The global has passed a significant turning point in 2020 as we experience the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which has accept devastating health and economic consequences worldwide. This pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges for agricultural sector. In addition to pandemic threaten to not only stagnate progress toward SDGs, but also has potential to reverse the, the, the gain made the recent years. The Thai government set up the subsidies and policy, the policy to e economies, including agriculture sector. The post COVID-19 measuring to effort assistance the, the, the Thai citizen is enhance the grassroots economic development at the local level nationwide. The national consumption factor, the monetary institutions such as Bank of Agriculture and Agricultural Cooperative, set to the initiative project such as 
emergency loan project, jump start credit project. This means short term loan for the new entrepreneur. New Gen Hub project. This initiative for the youth or person who prefer to move from the capital to their own city or hometown to be the new farmer or new business entrepreneurs and loan to increase liquidity project. Second, developing human capital is a key mechanism that will lead Thailand towards sustainable poverty eradication. Thailand has implemented many initiatives and capital. For instance, establishing educational fund for economically disadvantaged students to access quality education and launching career development fund for women in order to promote and strengthen women laws and participation which promote communities to become more self-reliant and more resilient and adaptive to change. Another highlight initiatives under the SDGs principle is Thailand Bio-Circular Green Economy or BCG Model Strategic Plan 2021 to 2026 will be employed to enhance capacity and competitiveness of ASEAN growing industry such as agriculture, food, energy, tourism, and hospitality. One possible area of cooperation is smart farming. Moreover, diversification of food products and products of higher value. This will generate more job and income for the people of ASEAN. Ministry of Interior by Department of Community Development initiate Kok Nong Na Model Project. This is Thai words, mean the farm area, including growing area and water supply in the farmland, which is a land management project by combining the new theory of agriculture with local agricultural wisdom so that the local farmers can utilize the entire farming area throughout the year, or we call one community, one product based on tourism project, which aims to irrigate. And the results from this project are astonishing with over 3,200 villages joy and more than uh, 64,000 OTOP product produced. So, emphasizing these principles with the clear goal, everyone will have seen agriculture, which is key mechanism to Thailand, has achieved a distinctive sustainable and resilience or rural development and poverty eradication, as well as inclusiveness, human capital development for all citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chai Chai, uh, for that enlightenment. Uh, may we now proceed with the next uh, panelist. Uh, may I now invite uh, Ms. Erin Sweeney, who is the lead of sustainable investment and inclusion from Grow Asia. Uh, Ms. Erin, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much. And it's a huge pleasure to be here with all of you today. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to be talking together about empowering women in agriculture in ASEAN as we complete International Women's Month in March. So I'm very pleased today to be sharing with you a project that Grow Asia is collaborating on, led of course by our partners at ASEAN and collaborating with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the UNFAO and funded by the Swiss government. I'll be sharing with you just a little bit about Grow Asia for some background to get started and then I'll dive directly into our topic here today. Grow Asia was created in 2015 by the World Economic Forum with a, a simple goal to improve smallholder farmers' productivity, profitability, and environmental sustainability using a very specific strategy of multi-stakeholder partnerships. So Grow Asia has six in-country teams across the region, 
a secretariat based in Singapore, and then we are very well connected to the World Economic Forum's strategies for agriculture at the global level. In terms of impact in the way that we've reached our mission, GrowAsia has engaged 520 partners as multi-stakeholder partnerships. We've reached 1.8 million smallholder farmers through 46 working groups that represent 18 different agricultural value chains. And we do all of this with 27 staff. I give you this background to explain why GrowAsia came to participate in the development and now the operationalization of a set of regional guidelines focused on responsible investment. These guidelines are called the ASEAN Guidelines on Promoting Responsible Investment in Food, Agriculture, and Forestry. And for the remainder of my presentation today, I'll use the shorthand ASEAN RAI. The ASEAN RAI Guidelines are intended to attract socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable and inclusive investments by doing three things balancing the rights and interests of many different stakeholders from policymakers to investors to communities and farmer groups, but also by creating a guidance framework to show each of those stakeholder groups how they can contribute to ensuring that these investments are responsible. And then lastly, to establish a reference for all future behaviors and decisions about investments in ASEAN going forward. The ASEAN RAI were first conceived in 2017 when the ASEAN Secretariat requested the development of a set of regional guidelines that were aligned to the international guidelines set by the Committee for World Food Security, the principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems. The ASEAN was the first group to set up a set of re such regional guidelines. There were a group of partners then engaged, and these partners are represented across the entire region, and we may have some of them on the call here today, who are now working to implement these guidelines. Those partners work together to gather feedback from over 200 stakeholders across the region. And then in October 2018, the senior officials meeting of the ASEAN Ministers of Agriculture and Forestry officially adopted these guidelines. And to note, that was the same meeting that the gender mainstreaming guidelines were also adopted by the SOM AMOF. So now GrowAsia and all of the partners across the region are working to deliver a 10 year action plan, which was also officially adopted by the SOM AMOF in 2019. And today I'll share a bit more with you about what is involved in that action plan but very specifically how responsible investments can have a positive impact on women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains. The ASEAN RAI guidelines cover 10 important thematic areas that policymakers as well as investors should consider in both setting policy, but also in actual practices on the ground during and after investment periods. Those 10 thematic areas areas include everything from food security and nutrition of the surrounding community that is impacted by the investment, to economic development, ensuring that poverty rates are reduced and there are fair and decent jobs made available for people in the surrounding community, that land tenure rights are respected, the FPIC processes are followed, natural resources must be preserved and conserved, and so on. But again, I would like to highlight that Guideline three has an explicit focus on empowering women, youth, indigenous groups, and other marginalized peoples. And I'll be sharing a bit more detail about the specifics of that guideline with you all today. I would like to highlight how the ASEAN guidelines for promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry add value to both existing policies at the national level for ASEAN member states, but also add value for agribusiness and financial investors that are interested in adopting these practices. So the ASEAN RAI are aligned with at least nine SDGs, but in many cases more. They're applicable to diversified value chains for companies who have multiple value chains within their own operations because the ASEAN RAI cover any agricultural crop, forestry, or food production or manufacturing. 
As I mentioned, the ASEAN RIGHT are adapted from international standards to fit the regional context here in ASEAN. So there's a greater focus on technology and innovation, of course, the impact of climate change on our region and focusing on the regional approach made possible by the ASEAN. The ASEAN RAI are voluntary at this point, but through the 10-year action plan, the project partners will be helping to integrate these guidelines into national policy. And then of course, they will become required for all stakeholders to follow. I point out here that multi-stakeholder engagement is a requirement of achieving responsible investment in ASEAN. Of course, everything from the investors making the project on their own value chains, the role of the policymakers setting the guidelines for investors to follow, financial institutions to provide backing that requires investors to follow such standards, and then civil society groups, farmer organizations, and communities where those investments are taking place must also understand the ASEAN RAI guidelines and be able to hold stakeholders accountable. As part of the role of community, I'll now take you through a deep dive into how women and youth are both particularly engaged and have the opportunity to be empowered through the operationalization and implementation of the ASEAN RAI. We know that women in ASEAN and agriculture face a wide variety of constraints. We've heard about them from the previous two panelists at the regional level and then specifically in Thailand. So I'll take just a moment to highlight the six constraints that the ASEAN RAI are particularly focused on. Those include the fact that women's contribution is often invisible in the sector because they contribute very low or unpaid labor in agricultural value chains. There's often lower access to employment for women, particularly during investments that involve putting in some kind of manufacturing facility. There's the ongoing challenge that women face with access to land rights and tenure and titles, as well as resources such as agri inputs and financial capital. Women struggle with access to gender sensitive and responsive education, information, and trainings, including the kinds of field level trainings that investors provide as part of their investments. And this might be due to uh, sociocultural barriers uh, or to women not being invited to participate directly or many other reasons. We also know that women face increased vulnerability to the socioeconomic impacts of climate change and are more likely than men to have to produce food on degraded land that has uh, struggled and particularly land that has greater soil erosion due to the challenges that they face around land tenure rights. And then lastly, women in ASEAN face challenges related to participation in community decision-making, again, for a range of social, social, cultural, and political reasons. So the ASEAN RAI guideline number three gives very specific suggestions for ways that policy can ensure investments actually foster equality, engagement, and empowerment of women. We know that responsible investment contributes to a wide variety of opportunities for women, which I'll now share with you. Everything from the promotion of human rights and a more equitable access to opportunities to acknowledging women's contribution to the sector, that inclusive business models ensure women have access to jobs and even to entrepreneur, entrepreneurial opportunities along agricultural value chains. It also can contribute to women having increased access to land when investors are able to request and require to see land titles of the surrounding farmer communities. We do see lowered vulnerability to climate change when investors are paying attention to the impact of protecting natural resources around the investment site and to mitigating climate change in whatever ways they can. So that comes back to benefit women in the value chains as well. And then during consultation periods and throughout the process of making an investment, investors can and should ensure that women are engaged and participating actively in decision-making and leadership around those kinds of community consultations that investors are required to conduct in many cases. 
we do hear from partners in the GrowAsia network that they often will try to ensure that women are present and that often it's by focusing on women's groups and having women specific discussions that ensures that they do have that participation of women and also youth during the consultation periods. The ASEAN ARIA guideline three, but also woven throughout all 10 guidelines also provide suggestions for again, policymakers in terms of the policy they can put in place, as well as practices that investors can follow during investment periods. Those include improving women's access to education, legal redress and the right to organize, providing gender sensitive extension services, recognizing women's key role in family and community food security, which links directly back to the achievement of ASEAN RAI guideline one, that the importance of facilitating partnerships and networks among CSOs, farmer groups, and women's cooperatives, and then also that focus on young women and young people's access to resources, markets, and opportunities throughout the investment. Through GrowAsia's network of those 520 partners, we've had the opportunity to learn from our agribusiness partners, several of whom you will hear speaking as reactors later today, about why agribusinesses and financial institutions are interested in investing in women during a larger investment project. So I'll share with you just this one case study, but there are many such case studies out there and I look forward to having our reactors share additional details with you shortly. In this case, the East West Seed, which is a multinational seed company based here in the region, but has global operations, runs a program called Knowledge Transfer that trains vegetable farmers, and they've already trained 300,000 women across the world. They focus specifically on women as their key trainers. And they shared with us that there's a business case for this. Women are more likely to share the knowledge that they gain from trainings and more likely to then bring that knowledge directly into the communities, which has a direct impact on good agricultural practices in the vegetable sector. They found that women are also often use technologies more accurately than their male counterparts. And they're finding anecdotally that women tend to invest in better inputs when they see results and they look for the same brands over and over again, which of course is a benefit to any individual company. East West Seed has several key considerations in the development of this program, including that they work closely with community leaders to identify how to increase access to those trainings and educational opportunities, as I just covered and to encourage informal discussions with women's networks, cooperatives, and groups, again, to ensure that women's voices are heard, even when any sociocultural context may make that difficult. I'll share just a quick quote from our partner at East West Seeds when asked how they engage women farmers as trainers. He replied that they ensure that women were aware if they took on that role as a key trainer, they could also balance that with the expectations that they face within their own families. And then as more women became comfortable, the company themselves noticed a big difference in the impact of their training programs on the surrounding community. I'd like to leave you with a few key considerations when we're thinking about, again, the role of women in agricultural value chains, specifically in the context of responsible investments through the ASEAN RAI guidelines. We know, and our speakers have already highlighted this, that women's roles in decision-making, access to resources and agency vary widely across ASEAN, which is why when we're looking at regional policy recommendations, we must also consider the specific geographic, social, cultural, and political context when we're promoting this regional harmonized approach. Lastly, I'll just share with you a few details about what we're planning to do in ASEAN RAI 10 year action plan together with partners across the region. And I do encourage any of you on the call today to get in touch with us to become involved in this process. The vision is that by 2030 together we can facilitate a measurable increase in responsible and sustainable private sector investment. The first pillar of work includes direct support to ASEAN member states to integrate the ASEAN RAI into national policies. The second is to develop a learning and accreditation program, which will ultimately offer online courses to train over 
400 investment experts who can advise on future investments in the region. We will be having annual events to share learnings and best practices across any stakeholders involved in responsible investment, as well as national workshops specifically targeted at farmer organizations and NGOs. And then lastly, we'll be working closely with agribusiness and financial investors to help understand how the ASEAN Ride can contribute to their existing commitments to various tools and standards. And we're currently putting together a series of case studies that demonstrate how agribusiness investors are already following responsible practices across the region. And we'll use those case studies in informing policy consultations together with the ministries of agriculture in any of the 10 ASEAN member states. I'd also like to take this opportunity to alert everyone on the call today that our partner, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, together with the ASEAN Secretariat, has developed a tool for ASEAN member states to use to align and understand the existing alignment between their own policies and the 10 principles of the ASEAN REI. That tool has already been made available directly to ASEAN member states, and we will soon be featuring it on our website. So I'll provide the website link here to all of you, and I do encourage you to check out the website and the resources there, as well as to get in touch with any questions. Thank you again so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from the next speaker. Thank you very much, Erin, uh, for explaining um, how the RAE or uh, guideline addresses uh, women's empowerment in agriculture. So, so Erin highlighted that uh, uh, women in agriculture in ASEAN face barriers uh, quite unique compared to men, uh, especially related uh, to their participation in community uh, decision-making, uh, vulnerability to the impacts of climate change and access to education and also to trainings. So therefore, I think the message is that if investors ignore these uh, challenges, which are uh, relatively unique, uh, they may worsen or negatively impact women's uh, economic opportunities, uh, specifically in the agricultural communities. So the ASEAN guidelines uh, is a useful tool uh, designed for uh, policymakers and investors to have positive impact on women's economic empowerment uh, during uh, investment periods. So this guideline is a framework for policies. Uh, the ASEAN Ray can certainly help ensure that investors are required, uh, I, I assume, to use more equitable approaches across all the ASEAN uh, member states. Uh, so with that, uh, we will uh, we conclude uh, with uh, the presentation by Ms. Erin Sweeney. Uh, so we encourage all uh, participants here to uh, chat uh, on on the. Uh, uh, sorry, to, to raise any questions that you may have uh, to the speakers uh, that have already presented, uh, they will be directly responded uh, by them. So as, as uh, for the next uh, agenda, uh, I would like to inform that over the past months and considering the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia or ISEA has been working on a set of guidelines uh, which are meant to support and incentivize the practice of the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women economic empowerment in the agricultural value chains among enterprises, corporations towards inclusive uh, recovery and building back fairer. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, the next panelist, uh, Dr. Marie Lisa Dakanai, who is president of ISEA, and she will be addressing on how the proposed guideline will address gaps in ASEAN policies uh, in agriculture and in the agricultural value chains. Uh, Dr. Dakana, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, and uh, I, my, I've been asked to present uh, the proposed ASEAN guidelines on the promotion of transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains, which as Ronnie has actually said, uh, they are uh, a set of proposed guidelines that seeks to incentivize the practice of a set of benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains. Um, may I just present to you how we evolved those set of benchmarks before I go to the guidelines themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So we evolved the set of benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains through an action research that we did as far back as 2015 
where we look at significant practices of social enterprises and inclusive businesses in agricultural value chains in the ASEAN. And we basically answer the question, how did these social enterprises and inclusive businesses successfully transform the lives of their partner small producers, especially women? So Isaiah undertook this action research in the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia in partnership with Dumpet Duafa and Venus Wadaya, Change Fusion, and CISIF. And we came up with these benchmarks. Uh, let me now introduce to you the benchmarks no? in terms of the principles. Next slide. So the benchmarks that we evolved from this study of best practices of social enterprises and inclusive businesses that have impacted uh, significantly on the lives of women small-scale producers and men small-scale producers in ASEAN uh, have eight, these eight guiding principles. The first is women and men small-scale producers are actually assisted to be included in value chains through appropriate technology and community-based oriented innovation. The second guiding principle is that over time, women and men small-scale producers are able to get a more substantive share of value created over time in these value chains as they're not just producers, but they become processors, marketers, or even owners of their own brands of agricultural commodities or products. The third principle is about ensuring food security and resilience that no matter the value chain, that these women and men small-scale producers are actually assisted to be food secure and resilient. Uh, the fourth principle is about the empowerment of small producers. Uh, women and men small-scale producers are assisted not only to become effective uh, workers, suppliers, uh, clients in agricultural value chains, but effective owners, as well as leaders and members of organizations that actually engage uh, not only in the value chain itself economically, but they become actors in their own development. Uh, the fourth, the fifth principle is about uh, women and men small scale producers being assisted to become stewards um, and to become stewards and stakeholders of um, sustainable consumption and production systems in agricultural value chains. Uh, the sixth principle is about transactional and transformational services that the women and men small scale producers are assisted not only to become effective workers, suppliers, clients, but to become effective owners as well as leaders and members of organizations that, um, that, that only participate in value chain development, but also in community development. Uh, the seventh principle is about in, ensuring women's participation and empowerment, not only in the value chains, in, not only across value chain functions, but in all uh, value chain development organizations and uh, governance. No? Um, the last principle is about um, multi-stakeholder partnerships as well that has been actually mentioned earlier also by other speakers um, that this, uh, the multi-stakeholder partnerships that assist women and men small-scale producers produce measurable outcomes of transformation uh, in terms of the impact on the women and men small-scale producers, their uh, households, their communities, and the value chains and economic subsectors. Having explained to you these eight guiding principles uh, that um, guide the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment and agricultural value chains, we actually ask the question, next slide please, uh, what kinds of policies would support the practice of these benchmarks? Uh, we, as Ronnie was actually saying, we actually developed um, scorecards no? for social enterprises, inclusive businesses, uh, small women as uh, small, uh, small, medium and um, small and medium enterpri enterprises, as well as corporate agribusinesses and agricultural value chain program holders. We develop scorecards so that they can uh, be guided to, you know, um, practice these guidelines and these uh, benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains. But when we did the policy research, we looked at what could be the, the, those that could support and incentivize the practice of these benchmarks. Um, and we noted that there were four major development challenges in ASEAN that make uh, the set of um, incentives and supporting policies important in the practice of these benchmarks. The first is the impact of COVID-19. No? The challenge of response, responding effectively to the effects and impact of COVID-19 and similar disasters 
on women and men small scale producers and their need for food security, social protection, and resiliency. The second development challenge is the, the need for inclusive economic growth, no? uh, which is actually the challenge of inclusive economic growth that reduces poverty in the food, agriculture, and forestry sector, which from our study is not given enough attention by the ASEAN guidelines on responsible investments in food, agriculture, and forestry, and even such policies as the roadmap on the role of agricultural cooperatives in global value chains. Uh, the third major development challenge is as the need for accelerating the SDGs. No? The challenge of accelerating the attainment of the SDGs among poverty sectors in general, and women and men small-scale producers in particular, which even before the pandemic were actually judged as already um, failing in terms of, um, I mean, lagging behind, you know, that they would not be achieved by 2030. And then the last major development challenge uh, is, the, is women's empowerment itself, the challenge of engaging women in agriculture and the informal sector as subjects for empowerment beyond women in the formal economy and women entrepreneurs, which existing policies on women's empowerment in ASEAN focuses on. So with, with, this, um, with this development challenges, we actually evolved the guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains through a, a policy research. And um, next slide, please. The, the, the guidelines themselves are aimed at the ASEAN economic community and the public sector in ASEAN. Uh, they're to be promoted primarily among ASEAN member states to encourage and enable agricultural value chain players to practice the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains through policies, incentives, program support, and related activities. And we noted the special role of social enterprises and inclusive businesses as the benchmarks were developed from their best practices. And we believe that the, the guidelines uh, need to be promoted by social enterprises, need to promote the role of social enterprises and inclusive businesses as transformational partners of women and men small scale producers to bring the benchmarks to fruition. So uh, in terms of the ASEAN guidelines, again, uh, they will be voluntary like the RAI, but um, they, uh, they're, uh, they're oriented at enhancing and complementing existing ASEAN policies, approaches, and guidelines. No? Uh, and these policies include programs and policies focusing on the recovery from COVID-19, um, the RAI, which is the Responsible Investments in Food, Agriculture, and Forestry, the Roadmap for Enhancing the Role of Agricultural Cooperatives in Agricultural Global Value Chains, the Action Plan for SME Development, and Chapter 11 of the SME Policy Index, and then women's economic empowerment policies, including AMAP's approach to gender mainstreaming in food, agriculture, and the forestry sectors. And of course, inclusive business policies that already exist in ASEAN, but no, likewise noting that there's an absence of policies recognizing and supporting social enterprises. So let me now go to the guidelines that we evolved themselves based on the policy research that we did. Uh, the ASEAN Guidelines for Transformational Partnerships and Women's Economic Empowerment and Agricultural Value Chains has five major guideline elements. Um, next slide, please. The first guideline, next slide, please. The first guideline is about uh, innovative agricultural value chain development that supports programs to create food secure, resilient, and empowered small producer communities. I wouldn't be able to discuss the sub guidelines, but we may be able to do that if there's interest in, um, in the open forum, or we can also send you the policy paper. Uh, the second, next slide please. The second set of guidelines have to do with investments that expand and enable women's economic empowerment spanning all agricultural value chain for the functions and organizations engaged in ABC development, management, and governance. No? That's the second. The third guideline has to do with investments in sustainable consumption and production systems that enable women and men small producers as stakeholders in achieving a climate resilient and green economy. Um, the fourth guideline is about um, recognizing and supporting programs, including hybrid financing, a combination of loans and enterprise financing uh, for social enterprises and inclusive businesses as key enablers of women and men small-scale producers in agricultural value chains. And then the last guideline is about 
uh, support for cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder platforms um, that mainstream sustainable agriculture, transformational partnerships, and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains towards measurable out social impact and accelerating the SDGs. Now, of course, um, you have already heard about the Grow Asia platform uh, as an example. Another example would be the Women's Empowerment Livelihood and Food in Agricultural Value Chains platform that is promoting um, the benchmarks that has been explained and also the set of guidelines. No? So all in all, my last slide please. Uh, the ASEAN Guidelines for Transformational Partnerships and Women's Economic Empowerment and Agricultural Value Chains, these proposed guidelines uh, are, and are intended to enhance and complement existing ASEAN and ASEAN member state policies towards fostering innovation, towards food security, resilience, and empowerment of small producers, promoting women's economic empowerment in all functions and among all organizations engaged in agricultural value chain development, enabling sustainable consumption and production in agricultural value chains for climate resilient and a green economy, uh, recognizing and supporting social enterprises and inclusive businesses as enabling partners of small producers in agricultural value chains, and accelerating the SDGs through multi-stakeholder platforms and mainstreaming sustainable agriculture and transformational partnerships in agricultural value chains. Thank you very much. Back to you, Ron. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lisa, for uh, briefing us or updating uh, on how the uh, guidelines itself is uh, addresses the gaps in the ASEAN policies uh, in agriculture and agricultural uh, value chains. Uh, Dr. Lisa uh, list and list, uh, listed the eight principles of the guidelines and how the research included or at least engaged with all uh, stakeholders, including uh, policymakers uh, in the ASEAN member states to ensure that the guidelines itself can be implemented in all the ASEAN member states. Uh, she also highlighted and noted that uh, of the challenges, particularly uh, you know, caused by COVID, as well as the existing uh, development challenges of uh, women economic empowerment uh, itself. Uh, the guideline is, uh, is for the ASEAN economic community. It is voluntary. So she encourages all the partners here uh, to, to see how they can uh, creatively and innovatively uh, work together to promote the guidelines in the respective uh, countries. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Lisa. Uh, we see that there are a number of questions that have already been posted on the Q&A uh, chat box, and we encourage uh, more to do so as they will be uh, hopefully uh, uh, responded uh, by the speakers uh, themselves. So with that, allow me to proceed uh, with the next uh, agenda. And in this uh, session, we will have a panel of uh, reactors. Uh, we are pleased to uh, welcome two reactors from the private sector, Ms. Prelia Munandar, who is head of the Government and Industry Affairs in ASEAN for Corteva AgriScience, uh, which is a multinational agriculture company. And also Ms. Sung Sofa, who is the general manager of Sela Pepper, uh, which is a pepper production company in Cambodia. Uh, both of our esteemed reactors are members of the Grow Asia Network. Uh, they will share about their company's efforts on women's economic empowerment, as well as their perspectives about the need for regional policy guidelines uh, uh, like the GTPWEE in uh, agricultural value chains. Uh, we will hear first from Ms. Munandar and then from uh, Ms. Sofa. Uh, Ms. Munandar, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baroni. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everyone can hear me clearly. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here uh, to share my reaction to the distinguished speaker's presentations. Um, but before I share my reaction, I hope it's okay if I share quickly and introduce Corteva AgriScience. So Corteva AgriScience is a one-year-old company. We are, we're quite young. Uh, we're going to celebrate our second anniversary this June. But we have a combined uh, 200 years of combined legacy of our, uh, of our legacy companies, Dow Agri Sciences and DuPont uh, in crop protection, seed technology, and digital agriculture. And across the world, we operate in uh, more than 140 countries, employing more than 20,000 employees. And we conduct research and development in agriculture in over 150 countries, including in ASEAN. 
So I have three points under uh, uh, in, uh, in my reaction. Uh, the first one is why women empowerment program is important to Proteva. The second one is what we've been doing and what we'd like to do in the future to increase impact. And the last one is what we need to succeed. So the first one, why women farmers are important to Proteva. Last year, Corteva launched our Global Sustainability Goals 2030, which includes our commitments not only in land preservation, but also in increasing farmers' livelihood and income, in uh, improving our operations and products to, make, to ensure that we can uh, food, produce food more sustainably and safer in the future. And Last uh, uh, but not least, our uh, community engagement, our commitment to community engagement, particularly uh, to women farmers and youth. And in ASEAN, we are focusing on uh, increasing farmers' income and uh, engaging women farmers. Why are women farmers important to Proteva? I think you know, our distinguished speakers have shared a lot of data and statistics to show that women farmers are very important to the economy. But Corteva has also done our own studies. In 2018, we conducted a global study among uh, around 4,000 women in 17 countries. And some of the findings include uh, that half, only half of the women claimed that they uh, they have equal uh, they they are equally successful as their male counterparts, and only forty two percent of the women surveyed claimed that they have equal business opportunity to meet their male counterparts. We also conducted a gender study uh, in Indonesia with our partner Prisma uh, among one thousand two hundred female farmers uh, in six provinces in Indonesia. And one of the key findings that we found in the study is that women farmers are influencers in their farm's decision-making process, uh, meaning that they don't have the ultimate decision. The ultimate decisions are with their husbands, but they have a, large, a, lot, a lot of influence in that decision-making process. And most importantly, they hold the first strings in the family, in the household. So I think that particular uh, data um, combined with a lot of the information that the speakers have shared, uh, including the case study that Aaron uh, has shared uh, based on the East-West uh, seats, I think shows that there's a clear benefit to companies in engaging women farmers and increasing their productivity and income. But what has Corteva done and what are we planning to do? So in ASEAN, we have several existing partnerships and programs. In Indonesia, we have been partnering with Prisma since 2016, uh, and we have benefited around 14,000 farmers, 37% of them women, and increased their income by 170% uh, net income uh, with our hybrid corn seeds. In the Philippines, uh, we have set up more than 50 edu farms across the country, uh, reaching around 1,000 farmers, and we this partnership wouldn't have been possible without the support of the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines that helped us to map locations and prioritize areas where we can make the most impact to farmers. In Vietnam last year, we trained 50, 000, around 50,000 women farmers in partnership with our distributor. And we've also, together with GrowAsia and other partners, launched GrowHer, a microsite to help women farmers and agripreneurs develop using the information, resources, and inspiring stories that are available in the microsite. So those are, you know, with, with all these programs, we also would like to launch a new program in partnership with GrowAsia this year called Thrive. So the purpose, the objective of this program is to uh, develop a, a, a training uh, program and business development program that specifically addresses challenges of women farmers and agripreneurs in ASEAN. And we're going to uh, pilot this uh, program uh, first in Indonesia, Vietnam, and then later in the year in the Philippines. Now, what do we need to see? We are very excited and encouraged by uh, Dr. Dekanai's um, presentation about the ASEAN guidelines, GTP and WEE and AVCs. This is still a mouthful of uh, abbreviations for me. Uh, and some of the points in the guidelines that I particularly think would be able to support our efforts in ASEAN are encouraging the formation of women-led small producer associations, recognizing the right of women to own land, and addressing systemic barriers to gender equality and entrepreneurship. 
Cortave is looking forward to play our part uh, through our existing programs and also through the upcoming five partnerships with Grow Asia and other partners, which looks to be aligned with the guidelines, particularly related to trainings and mentorship programs for women farmers and agripreneurs. We believe that a harmonized approach to WE and ABCs across ASEAN would really help us in facilitating such partnerships in the future. And we welcome additional partners to the project so we can reach more women and make a measurable and sustainable impact together. And we look forward to engaging policymakers in ASEAN to see how we can jointly advance women entrepreneurship. That's all from me, Paroni. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my reaction. Uh, so thank you, Prila, for that. Um, we can go with our next uh, reactor, Ms. Uh, Sung Sofa, please. You have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's very um, a pleasure for me to be part of uh, this Asian Women Empowerment. Um, yeah, so first of all, I would like to give uh, you all about uh, um, myself and the company. Yeah, so uh, my name is Sopar and I have been working for Sela Pepper as the general manager for six years. So I was the um, the first, I mean, staff at the company to build up the facility and to build up the management and everything for the company. And uh, yeah, so right now it's a sell of paper, it's a, a manufacturing for black pepper and exporting to overseas. And we have all the um, international food safety standard and um, Yep, uh, we have our own product and selling directly to the supermarket. Okay, and uh, for my reaction to all these policies, and uh, since I've been working uh, for these companies and I have met uh, a lot of the farmers and uh, have been to the meetings and everywhere, most of the participation or farmers are men. So, and yes, I, I've been uh, asking, you know, why the woman not involved. And so I could understand that this um, kind of, sometimes here is a traditional as well, and the woman doesn't want to, uh, to be in front of the, the man. And uh, yes, so, but right now, slowly, slowly, the woman more involved with the agriculture and um, I hope this uh, uh, policy can in, encourage and the more benefit for women to, to involve with the agriculture sector. And uh, I really, I mean, I just, after this public, the, the policies and other things, and I hope that uh, it will be a good implement to this uh, policy, and I would love to see more and more women to to uh, to interact to the agriculture because it's not only manpower, and it's a woman are playing a very important role in this uh, agriculture sectors as well. So yeah, this is uh, just my reaction to this uh, meeting discussion. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sofa, yeah. for, the, for the excellent uh, uh, response and uh, reaction. Uh, yeah. So we, we, we thank uh, both uh, reactors uh, for this. And uh, I see that we, we still have some time. And I also uh, observe that there are uh, questions uh, in the Q&A uh, chat box. So perhaps we can address uh, two two to three questions, uh, allowing for some time. So the first I see is one uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Lisa. Uh, this is from uh, Sark Makna of Cambodia. Uh, she asks that, uh, as you may know, the current situation around the world regards to COVID-19. So how can we promote women economic in agriculture during COVID-19? What do you think if we consider on digital thing to against women small business to promote uh, their product. Uh, Dr. Lisa? Uh, thank you, Ronnie. 
Um, yes, uh, actually, the guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains is also a set of guidelines that as, uh, hope to assist in um, inclusive recovery and building back favor, no? as was explained earlier. And uh, in relation to how we are actually doing that on the ground, uh, we are, while we are promoting the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains to uh, social enterprises, inclusive businesses, uh, agribusiness corporations, uh, SMEs, uh, we are also assisting them to do inclusive recovery planning. No? So we're helping, to, we're helping these companies as well as these, um, these enterprises to look at uh, the, the exact impact of COVID-19 on their small producers, especially women, and to see how we can help to plan with them for inclusive recovery in their own supply chains. No? So it's very specific to every supply chain that we encounter. Uh, but of course, the reason why we are promoting um, the set of guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment and agricultural value chains is that we believe that we need to do, do this more systematically through uh, policies and programs that are themselves promoted by government. No? So that's the reason why the set of guidelines are urgent, as I said, uh, in the face of COVID-19. On the issue about um, digital digital marketing or digital technologies, uh, this is actually equitable access to digi digital technologies and e-commerce platforms is actually a part of the sub guidelines um, for the uh, of the overall guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment and agricultural value chains. So we recognize that given the change, the drastically changed context of COVID-19 and the pandemic, that um, we need to assist women and men small scale producers to actually access um, digital technologies as well as e-commerce platforms, which they are not necessarily uh, access, are, which they're not, they're, which is, um, of course, more accessible now to those that are in the urban areas, whereas many of the women and men small scale producers are actually in the rural areas, and some of them are actually in remote areas that don't have access to digital technologies. So uh, maybe this is where, again, government can play a big role, because I think if we talk about uh, digital infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure for access to digital technologies. It's not something that, um, you know, uh, just um, non-government organizations or even corporations can do by themselves, no? but it has to be in partnership with government. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lisa. So, uh, Sark Makna, I hope uh, that elaborate question uh, is answered. Uh, I, I also see that Erin uh, has quickly responded to some of the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, very good. And in fact, I think uh, they are also trying to see how they can engage uh, with your partners in Cambodia. So, so please do uh, do that uh, quickly and, and it's very good. Uh, we have some more questions and perhaps I can just read them out. And if any of the uh, speakers or reactors would like to respond, please do so. Uh, this question is from uh, Anna from Indonesia. So she writes, uh, until today, despite efforts to segregate the women and men farmers, apparently their problems are mostly the same. Lack of access to agricultural inputs, trainings, information and marketing services. And this is based on uh, a, a recent ASEAN post uh, uh, publication. So nowadays everywhere sustainable for food system is a trending topic. I wonder whether we can already identify what would be the role of women to support achieving this, especially in supplement to what men can do so as to avoid overlaps. Uh, is this possible, do you think? Can I have some of the speakers to, to, to respond to this? Well, maybe I can start. Yes, please. Yes. Dr. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's not that we are segregating women from men. No? Uh, what we are actually saying is that in agricultural value chains, as was explained by one of our reactors, no? when you say farmer and when uh, and farmers are engaged by governments, um, they're usually men. No? Um, women are there, but actually the problem is they're invisible. 
and uh, there being invisible in agricultural value chains is one of the main issues that we're trying to address uh, by actually promoting the set of benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains so that they can actually be assisted to be included uh, to have equal access you know, to, uh, to the resources as well as to the trainings and to the and to all the other um, and all, to, to all the other uh, capacity development uh, um, uh, programs that are available. But I agree with you that um, both women and men share many common problems, no? And I think that's the reason why we're also emphasizing in the benchmarks that we're not just talking about women economic empowerment, because the context is that there are many issues that women and men, small scale producers face that have not be, been given enough attention, even by the right. You know? And that's the, uh, the reason why we are now wanting to promote a set of guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment and agricultural value changes that we believe that ASEAN needs to give a bigger attention to women and men small-scale producers alike. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lisa. I, I see that uh, Ms. Lan Mercado is already online, but perhaps before uh, we go to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the closing, may, may I, I think we have one more question. Uh, so let's, uh, this is from, okay, it's from, it's anonymous, but anyway. Uh, the plans, policies, and programs presented are definitely very useful and beneficial for rural women and other vulnerable groups. However, I'm just curious on how we can implement all of these in the rural areas where some private entities and political interests become uh, the barrier. And also, does the extension system have any impact on these plans, policies, and programs? In some areas of the region, the extension system is poorly managed uh, or implemented. Another is how can we penetrate cultural barriers to reach out uh, to the indigenous people? Uh, Dr. Lisa, perhaps? Yeah, uh, thank you, Rani. Uh, I guess that's the main reason why in the set of guidelines we're giving special attention to the role that social enterprises and inclusive businesses can play in the in reaching out you know, to marginalized women and men small scale producers including indigenous peoples you know? and there have been many studies and there have been many experiences where indigenous peoples uh, people um, fishers um, uh, agricultural workers as well as uh, landless uh, landless people engaged in value chains are actually being done at the moment by uh, social enterprises and inclusive businesses, you know, working as transformational partners of these women and men small scale producers across upland, lowland, coastal communities in order for them to be uh, inclusive, you know, uh, to be included uh, in, in agricultural value chains, not only as producers, but if you remember the benchmarks that I presented, the second benchmark have, has to do with this, um, this uh, women and men small scale producers, not only to become producers, but to also become processors as well as owners of their own brands. You know? uh, like in one of the cases, for example, is coffee. You know? In the Philippines, there is a, an, a, a social enterprise called Bote Central, and they are working in 51 different agricultural communities, including indigenous people's communities. And they're assisting these women and men small scale producers to actually not only produce green coffee beans, no? But they're helping them to uh, to uh, to process these green coffee beans into coffee, and to even have their own brands of coffee. No? And in these fifty-one communities, many of them already own their own brands of coffee. So uh, maybe the private interest groups that are actually usually given attention because they're bigger can be can be um, effectively. Uh, address no, that the, the importance of giving more attention to women and men small scale producers can be addressed better in ASEAN if uh, a policy on social enterprises can actually be uh, incorporated uh, as well as um, inclusive businesses can be encouraged to have more transformational partnerships with their uh, with women and men small scale producers um, through partnerships with non government organizations as well as social enterprises and cooperatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lisa. Uh, 
I see that we have a bit more questions. So I hope uh, uh, Ms. Lan can indulge us <laughs> for, for a few more uh, minutes. I think these are interesting questions. And perhaps Erin, if you have any of your thoughts to, to add on to these questions, uh, please jump right in. Uh, may I take a question from Shah Abdul Salam? Uh, the question is, how can South Asian organizations be a partner of this women in agriculture program who are working with women and men farmers? Erin, uh, would you like to take uh, this question? Sure, and actually I answered uh, live another question with someone who had asked, uh, based in Nepal, I think um, today's conversation is mostly focused on uh, ASEAN policies and ASEAN stakeholders, but I'm very thrilled to see so many attendees today here from South the South Asian region. And so I'm happy to also put directly in the chat a few other resources for getting connected in that space. And I would imagine that um, my co-panelists would also do the same. Bonnie, do you mind if I, I jump back to answer uh, the last question, but I can also see some themes and some some of the uh, yes, yes, more yes. recent questions specifically yes. about that that kind of grassroots level. And I really appreciate what Ms. Lisa just shared. But I would just add to that that one very practical approach that I know uh, companies as kind of global as Corteva and as local as Settler Pepper from our both of our reactors take very careful care to engage local actors, particularly by hiring women from local communities to deliver field demonstrations and trainings, for example, or to actually become the sales agents for those products. In the case of Sell of Pepper, they collaborate with many farmer cooperatives and purchase directly from them. And so these behaviors, as Ms. Lisa said, with inclusive businesses, we are seeing a, an increase in these kinds of behaviors and options where local and indigenous women are being hired and engaged, often due to partnership with a local CSO or NGO or even farmer organization or cooperative. And it's that relationship that helps because our private sector partners at Grow Asia tell us often that they're very excited to learn how to do better, but it's often that they're not entirely sure where to find some of these resources or how to do it. So I think we would do well to encourage more spaces like this one where we're actually hearing from private sector partners who are doing this work on the ground and hear what some of the challenges they're facing might be so that we can then find out which transformational partnerships can be set up to, to actually address the grassroots level challenges that several of the, the questions are asking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Erin. So uh, let's take another question from uh... Uh, from Indonesia. This is from Eka Puspitasari, and she has the questions for all the panelists. So I think that's uh, that's yourself and, and, and Dr. Lisa. So the question is how to implement these guidelines at the grassroots level. So I guess she needed some guidance to see how she can actually help uh, promote this guideline. So Dr. Lisa, may I first start with you? Yes, uh, actually, if you are a practitioner, what is relevant is not the guidelines, but actually the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains. And actually the benchmarks, as I said, have been translated into scorecards. Uh, there's a scorecard for social enterprises and SMEs. There's also a scorecard for corporate agribusinesses. There's also a scorecard for agricultural value chain program holders, right? And these uh, scorecards are actually available online in our website. And so if you are a practitioner, I think the more practical um, tool is not the guidelines themselves, but the benchmarks for transformational partnerships that have been translated into scorecards as uh, you know, evaluation, planning, and learning tools. No? And if you're going to our website and to access that, if you're interested and are wanting to get engaged in the use of the benchmarks themselves in your own context, uh, we are willing, of course, to assist. Uh, but of course, that will always uh, entail some resources, right? Um, at the moment, we have a partnership with Oxfam as well as uh, the Swedish Embassy in Bangkok in implementing uh, this uh, or in pilot testing as well as promoting these benchmarks. And um, we are actually working with uh, six agribusinesses, SMEs and social enterprises to see how they can implement the benchmarks to improve their practice in their own context. And in the coming year, we are looking for 20 more partners 
uh, so that if you are interested, um, if you are an agribusiness, an agricultural, uh, an agribusiness corporation, you're a social enterprise, you're an inclusive business, you're an SME that is willing to actually uh, look at how your practice can be improved with the use of these benchmarks as uh, scorecards, no? as tools, then uh, I think you can get in touch with us. I can, um, you, can, um, you can be given our email uh, uh, and you know, we can engage you. No? So that's the more practical side of it. So the, the, the guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment, agricultural value chains, as we have explained, is more a set of uh, you know, policy, uh, tools for governments, uh, a set of policies, a set of uh, program guidelines that can actually be incorporated in government uh, policy and programs, right? So um, in order to incentivize the set of benchmarks, the practice of the benchmarks. So that's the relationship of the benchmarks and the guidelines, yeah? So back to you, Ron. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. So I think that is a direct invitation. So so please do take take uh, take this opportunity. Uh, let's go with one more uh, question before we uh, we proceed uh, with the closing. And um, we have one from. Uh, oops, I think they have been quickly answered by by Erin. Very good. So 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 we're reducing uh, the number of questions. Uh, Uh, Rami, may yes. I also answer a previous question about, um, you know, the how how the benchmarks can be implemented? All right, by... maybe that can be our our last question. Uh, please go uh, ahead, Dr. Lisa. But I didn't want to, to <laughs> make that the last question. <laughs> okay, because... go ahead, please. <laughs> no, but right. I just wanted to mention yes. that we do ha we have a uh, we have a platform actually that we um, launched in September 2020 called We Live Food in Agricultural Value Chains. We means women's empowerment, live means livelihoods, and food in agricultural value chains. And that is actually Asia Pacific wide. So if, um, I think we invite our friends to be in touch with us to, if you're interested to participate in a platform that is promoting the benchmarks, and that is promoting the guidelines beyond ASEAN, uh, the Asia Pacific um, platform that we launched in September 2020 during conference that we had with UNSCAP uh, is going to be very useful. And we are uh, actually recruiting more members to become part of the platform. So Ronnie, back to Okay, uh, yes, uh, so, so let's, I think we have one from Franchette Dulfo. Uh, I think this is from the Philippines. Um, so she writes, uh, you know, 2020 data from Cooperative Development Authority shows that women comprise more than men in agricultural cooperative sector, even if agriculture is a gender-based industry. However, unpaid labor and salary gap is widely experienced by women, I believe not only here, but globally. So therefore, we will be excited to apply for any financial programs, grants, and any other stakeholders in attendance. So I think this is also a, a call for partnership, if, if, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah. So, so all right, I think- uh, that May I just say something about yes, that? Yes, uh, please, uh, yes. apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, we are trying to work with uh, the cooperative sector because to us, um, co the cooperatives are actually an important segment of social enterprises, uh, specifically when the cooperatives are actually those uh, engaging women and men, small scale producers across upland, lowland, coastal communities, as well as indigenous communities. And so the comment I think, which has to do with importance of uh, um, gender mainstreaming in the cooperative sector, you know, I think, uh, which actually addresses the pay gap. It addresses also the uh, equal opportunities of women and men in uh, leadership positions. Uh, as well as uh, other gender issues such as unpaid care work. No? Because even if women are actually members of cooperatives, sometimes they're not able to become active because they are 
uh, they are actually confronted with a situation where in order for them to attend meetings, no, they, they, need, uh, they need their children to be taken care of by somebody else, right? Especially if they're still small. So that um, unpaid care work is actually a very important issue in agricultural value chains in order for us to include women as stakeholders, no? a part of their invisibility in agricultural value chains is because uh, they are unable to participate effectively given that the women are those who are expected to perform in unpaid care and domestic work. No? And um, th that's the reason why we, uh, we promote gender sensitivity, of course, so that women and men can share in household work. But uh, it, it might be interesting for the audience to know that um, what in our study on the impact of COVID-19 in areas where uh, social enterprises had gender programs. No? The women there experience, didn't experience the burden that other women in other areas experienced during COVID-19. No? Because of course, during COVID-19, unpaid care work was actually be became the big burden of women no? in most communities. But in areas where there were sen uh, gender sensitivity programs as well as uh, gender responsive policies already in place, no? Uh, the women there experienced that the men and other household members shared in the household work. And uh, of course, in these communities, there are also uh, mechanisms such as, um, such as uh, daycare centers no? that are provided so that women can become economically active, even if they have children who need to be taken care of. No? So one of the main things that we really need to look at is how unpaid care work uh, can be addressed. Um, and there's actually, in the study that we did on COVID-19, there is actually a proposal to develop social enterprises uh, that are um, focused on addressing unpaid care work so that in, the, in, in a manner of speaking, uh, we, could we could start to de develop what is called an unpaid care economy. Uh, that is not dependent only on the women in the household and the household members taking care of uh, their, their uh, household members who are sick or who are uh, still children, but uh, actually the whole ho communities uh, with assistance of social enterprises can start uh, addressing uh, unpaid care work as, um, as a systemic uh, issue uh, affecting um, women's inclusion and participation in um, the economy, including agricultural value chains. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. So uh, we are now nearing the, uh, uh, the hour. The, so may I ask for some closing uh, statements, at least from the other speakers? Erin, would you like to share any final thoughts? Sure, thank you so much again for the opportunity to the organizers of today's webinar and to my co-panelists and the reactors for the very insightful sharing. I would like to just um, leave everyone on the call today with this understanding that um, as I shared and then Dr. Lisa also shared, it is very much possible to operationalize these guidelines at the ASEAN level at the national and then subnational levels together through partnerships. So as a multi-stakeholder platform, Croatia is of course committed to making sure that we can link appropriate partners across ASEAN at those subnational or national levels. And please do reach out to us if you'd like to learn more or to get involved around the work we're doing and in responsible investment, but with the particular focus on women's economic empowerment. And we look forward to seeing the adoption of the ASEAN guidelines on transformational partnerships for women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains as well. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, may I now ask Dr. Sita uh, to present any final thoughts that uh, you may have to the audience here? Dr. Sita? Okay, maybe we can ask uh, Prelia if you have any final thoughts you would like to share. Thank you, Paroni. I think uh, I, I would just to reiterate our commitment, Proteva's commitment to improving uh, women farmers, um, empowering women farmers in ASEAN. And uh, we cannot stress enough the need for you know, a cross-sectoral partnership um, with uh, stakeholders from, from different sectors. So we, we welcome opportunities to partner, uh, particularly for um, 
existing programs that uh, we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now uh, I'll leave to uh, Ms. Sung for her final thoughts. Hey, uh, you mean uh, for me? <laughs> because you uh, yes. so far. Okay. Uh, yes, so far. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, yes. So yes, I would love uh, to give the final thought is that I I would like to see more women to to be involved with agriculture and um, get the more trainings and and knowledge um, about agriculture and not to be afraid that the agriculture is only for for manpower. It's actually for women as well to get involved. Yeah. So this is for my thought, and I hope this guideline and benchmark is to really uh, push and uh, encourage more women to get involved with agriculture. Thank you. Very good, very good yeah. uh, on, uh, on, on that positive final note. So yeah. with that, may I now miss, uh, invite Ms. Lan Mercado for the, for, who is the Regional Director for Asia Oxfam. Madam, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I caught the uh, question and answer portion. Um, and even just by listening to the questions and the responses of the panelists, I already picked up quite a lot. So um, I'd, I'd like to thank and extend my warm greetings to all of the speakers, as well as the reactors, uh, the members of the ASEAN Secretariat who have joined us in the round table to grow Asia uh, the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, UNS Cup Subregional Office um, for South Asia, and the Embassy of Sweden. And, and thank you to all the participants in this roundtable discussion on empowering ASEAN women in agriculture. I noted that we have quite a big number of participants, uh, and so I think that's, that's really good. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, ASEAN's exponential economic growth transformed the region into the world's fifth largest economy. Um, and that's, of course, partly driven by the integration of women in the labor market. In fact, um, in 2015, the average female labor force participation rate in ASEAN countries was close to 67%. But we all know that this has not really translated into equal opportunities for women. And the 2017 data from UN Women and the World Bank indicated that in almost all ASEAN member states, women tend to be predominantly in, in precarious and undervalued jobs. The ILO also reports that 64% of women workers in the ASEAN are in informal employment and mainly in the agriculture sector. So today, um, as we see the pandemic rage across the world, including our region, Southeast Asia and the whole of Asia, we know that some countries are more affected than others uh, by this public health crisis. But we also know that the pandemic, while primarily a public health crisis, has multiple dimensions and in many places, the economy is in a free fall. Our collective work to reduce poverty and inequality has been dramatically set back. I don't have statistics on food insecurity, specifically for Southeast Asia, but in the Asia Pacific region, 265 million people are going hungry in a region that depends on agriculture. Around 140 million have been pushed into extreme poverty, and this is just this January 2021 from the report of WFP, FAO, WHO, and UNICEF. So global institutions, including the World Bank and IMF, who are having their spring uh, meetings, and I attended the IDA meeting last night, they're all talking about strategies for a post-COVID-19 recovery. The pandemic has of course, highlighted and exacerbated inequalities, including gender inequality. We are seeing a global care crisis that remains significantly invisible in public policies, national budgets, and fairly absent from development finance more broadly. So any emergency support 
or recovery plan must be vehicles for addressing these inequalities and ensuring that we are on the path to an equal, gender fair, and climate just future. In this recovery, agriculture and the women who belong in this sector will have to be a key focus. And this is why this roundtable on empowering ASEAN women in agriculture was an excellent opportunity to dialogue, exchange ideas, and find solutions, including solutions that address paid and unpaid care work that is born mostly by women. I think this is where the proposed guidelines on transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in, in agriculture value chains could, could really be important, um, especially as it had been developed through a series of consultations with various stakeholders in the ASEAN. And so on behalf of all our partners and stakeholders, I'm also very thankful to those who participated and shared their helpful input, inputs to the guidelines. I would be badly remiss if I did not acknowledge the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, one of our longest and most committed partners in the transformative work on gender responsive investments in agriculture. ISEA has been one of the main drivers of the process and, and we are also grateful for the support and partnership with UNSCAP's sub-regional office in Southeast Asia, Grow Asia, the Embassy of Sweden in Bangkok, and the ASEAN Secretariat. The ASEAN guidelines on promoting responsible investments in food, agriculture, and forestry, um, especially with its aspiration of fostering equality, engagement, and empowerment for women, young people, indigenous people, and marginalized groups, is an important reference in the road to post-pandemic recovery. But the proposed guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains takes us further by addressing the specific needs of women small producers, particularly those engaged in agricultural production and in the informal economy of agricultural value chains and contributes to ensuring that post-pandemic recovery is inclusive and sustainable. Thank you very much. Our work, of course, does not end with a round table. I hope that as we close the meeting, we are taking with us ideas that we can now start translating into action. And I hope to see you out in the field. Once it is safe to go out back to the field. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Mercado, Regional Director for Asia uh, Oxfam. Uh, I see that there are more questions uh, online, so I, I would like to encourage all the speakers uh, to also address them uh, immediately soon. So with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, and also inform that all the presentations and recordings will be posted in the social media accounts for, uh, of the organizers. I thank everyone uh, for their participation, particularly those uh, who are uh, online. Uh, we thank you very much for your active participation and we hope that this session has been very useful. And again, we encourage uh, partnerships, networking to, uh, to continue uh, even after uh, this uh, event. So with that, I would like to uh, greet everyone a, a good day, stay safe, and hope to catch you uh, in one of our other events. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.